I'm Rashmi, this is Mike, and we're going to introduce our panelists. So grab a mic. My name is Nick. I'm a 20-year-old student here in Chicago, Illinois, and I've experienced homelessness before, and that is kind of why I'm here today to speak with you guys and to be with Rashmi and Mike. Thank you, Nick. Oh, you have to <laughs> um, I'm Casey, but you all know that already. Um, <laughs> And yeah. <laughs> I don't <think> it's <laughs> Hi, my name's Maria. Um, I'm 20 years old and I go to Truman. I'm about to turn 21. <laughs> Hi, I'm William. I'm 20 years old. Um, yeah, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> my name is Lala and I'm 20 years old and I'm from the night ministry. Thank you, guys. Um, so how many of you are from the night ministry here? Just So thank you for coming. I know someone else from night ministry is presenting later on, so you're represented. Um, I guess I'll switch mics. So we're going to keep our portion super small just to sort of set things in context about what we did with our young participants and um, others who are not here today. As I said, Mike and I are, or maybe I didn't say this, Mike and I are from Shed Studio. We are an architectural practice based here in Chicago. It's basically the two of us and our community of participants. Um, we work a lot on um, projects related to homelessness and affordable housing and um, supportive services that help scaffold up recovery and pathways out of homelessness. So a bunch of the projects we've done are up on the screen. Just gonna name a few. Mike is gonna jump in as he wants. Um, beds plus care. Um, speak of NIMBYism, this is out in the Grange. You might have read in the newspaper about the opposition to the project. Um, Inspiration Corporation, we did some federally funded uh, affordable housing for them. Growing Home, Urban Farm and Job Training Center, Cabrini Green Legal Aid Clinic, Rimland Housing for Adults with Autism, um, Incubator out in Englewood, what am I missing, Mike? And then uh, an another one right in the middle here the, with the green is um, uh, Y2Y, which is a brand new shelter in Cambridge that's a youth-oriented and youth uh, sort of uh, designed, if you will. And Rashmi was a sort of lead architect on that uh, and has gotten a, quite a bit of press recently. And it's really interesting and worth checking out if you're interested in that sort of thing. There's a thing in Huffington Post and a number of other spots. The, they're doing really interesting work uh, in Cambridge. and. Uh, we were really happy to be part of that. Um, and we are also along with, next slide. I'm trying. <laughs> All right, well, there, there we go. All as right. the next slide comes up, we are also um, co-founders along with Helen Slade, who's our director of a group called Territory. And Territory engages um, young adults and youth in Chicago to, engage, to look at local problems in their communities and in their lives. And um, through the lens of creativity, um, create healthier cities and diverse communities. So we thought that the Tiny Homes Project that is really about exactly that, how do we create healthy and diverse communities for, um, for our young people through the eyes of young people, we thought this would be a good project. Other things we've done is worked with um, with welcoming schools to design a, a welcoming school for McCutcheon. We've done um, Asia on Argyle. We've done Learning by Design. So we've done a bunch of other things. Please check us out. I don't want to talk too much about us right now. Yeah, uh, and those were all uh, design build projects we did with teenagers. Uh, it's always a kind of a funny terminology because we use, uh, uh, we work with a lot of teens, but then we also work with people who are, like in this situation, mostly in their early 20s. And so, like, I don't really know how you talk about it, like, the youth, you know? Like, I don't know, what do you guys like? I don't know. Youth. youth. All right, so we'll, we'll try to use that term. Um, so this particular project uh, was one that we, uh, when we heard about the tiny homes thing, we thought this is something that we could be really, uh, I think, useful on. Uh, and we decided to do a project where we worked with youth uh, to think about the tiny homes and, and possibly do an entry for the competition. Uh, but mostly just to kind of hear what they had to say about uh, housing issues, uh, kind of the idea of small homes, and that uh, sort of thing. So we had a couple different sessions. 
Um, one of the things that we bring to our projects is that we we realize that our job is somewhat curatorial, that designs and ideas exist um, in a more robust fashion amongst people who live and use these spaces. So we thought that instead of us coming up with a tiny home's design, we would really see what kind of home would our youth want to live in. And so we did a sort of a two-day workshop um, in the morning. The first day we talked about what would make a perfect day, you know, what kinds of things um, do young people experience day to day as they are moving about their lives. Um, some things that work well, some things that don't work well. And out of that came a discussion of what kind of community would people want to live in. So this was sort of the site planning exercise. Um, you've seen some slides of the floor plan. So every participant came up with their own home version of what the floor plan would look like, what, what kinds of things would go. So that's a floor plan that was done by one of the people at the panel. And you can see there's a you know, high level of design thinking that goes into this and you could, you know, put this in a different kind of software and think that it came from somebody in a design school. So we were very, very excited to see what came up and we were very happy with the kinds of um, ideas that came up. And so from this came sort of we stepped back and we then had a discussion and said, what does a tiny home community look like? So these are sort of going through some of the designs as kind of the elevation and um, Tracy was nice enough to host us in her house and be at our, at our table and participate with us. So this was sort of stepping back and talking about you know, what goes in a house. You can see that's a 3D sketch of what goes in a house, um, what kinds of things go in a house, and very soon you'll kind of see. Um, so this was the site plan. You know, how, how do the different um, tiny homes relate to each other? Do we want privacy? Do we not want privacy? Do we want to be able to have a smoker-only section? Do we want to have a section that is, you know, allows for pets and boxing rings and dance studios? You know, what needs to go there? Who picks up the garbage? Who maintains the area? You know, is there a basketball court or is there not a basketball court? You know, what role does nature play in the tiny homes community? And these were all things that, and you can notice that people were working so hard they didn't eat the cookies. Um, and then we had sort of a which, recap. Which I think is a first for us. It's a first yeah. for us. We had to literally push cookies on people, which because I never do. You know that the first thing <laughs> about doing anything in a sort of uh, a public community yeah. setting is always have uh, food, always have cookies. That's the, the number one rule. Um, so we sent in our entry and then we sat down and said, hey, look, we have a chance to be on this panel. What did we really learn from our entry and what do we really want to talk about? So is the slide going to stay up for a minute? Yeah, so this slide is going to stay up for a minute. Um, everything everybody talked about this morning was echoed. I think Casey said that to us. She said, did you hear how everything that was talked about, we talked about? And you can see this is a, you know, a lot of similarity, um, this notion of belonging and privacy, but also security and solidity that it should not feel sort of like a transient thing that you know, might not last long, um, that there is a sense of ownership, that there is a mail slot at your own door, um, there's some control over your life, that there's no curfew, um, that you both learn from and teach people that you share your community with, and that it's not a toy house, right? That this is a real house. It's not, you know, something that's somebody's hobby house. Um, so you can see here, um, we decided to embrace every idea that came out, and we put every idea out there. Um, and, and one thing that came up repeatedly was, here's the house and here's the customized part of it. So our entry was called the plus one entry, is that every house has a piece that becomes personal to whoever lives there. So for example, Nick might have a bee factory and a greenhouse to grow plants that has solar panels on top. Uh, Maria may have a little um, computer room for her to do work study. Casey, I don't know anything about you, Casey, but maybe you'd want a dance studio. And Layla will be designing the exterior of the house to look like her dream Barbie house, right? So that everybody has a chance to customize and personalize because although we all stand up here and design it, we want to be able to say this is a house that you want to live in and what do you want in it. So this notion of the plus was here's the house with all the basic uses and here's the plus part of it that is unique to each user came up. 
Okay, so what we're going to do right now is we're just going to move in. We pulled out, uh, obviously there was a lot of discussion as we were going along. Uh, we pulled out uh, four different, uh, uh, we used a lot of post-it notes when we do these things, four different post-it notes that seem to uh, kind of capture a moment and then have some questions next to it. And we're going to sort of hand it over and I'm going to prompt them as we go along. Uh, so one of the ones was, we believe you belong here. That was one of the sort of quotes that came up during our discussions. Uh, and let's see, who would like to, maybe Will, you want to take a, take a stab at that? Yes. Um, so we believe you belong here was the one we all agreed on um, because it is a community we want to try have it a safe community uh, where it feels like home to everyone. So like the plus one, if you like to read or if you like video games, like we want the home to be somewhere where you belong, a little piece of yourself in it. And uh, <clears throat> I believe in this term that, uh, well, you belong, safe community. We need to be in a safe community so we don't have to always be on alert, but we always will be on alert no matter what we are or where we are going. And the plus one thing is great because then we all have our own personal thing that we want. Maybe we want more than just one, two. Maybe we just want this. For example, I'm you're, just saying. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'll raise it to two because you never know. Maybe somebody likes dancing, somebody likes singing. Maybe they like dancing and reading or, you know, they like different things. They could always combine it into one room, though. <laughs> um, this, this one stood out to me because not only feeling like you belong in your apartment, but within your community as well. And as I was listening to a lot of the presenters early, a lot of the key things were community and feeling like they belonged within that space. And that was a good term for us. And when I saw, when I thought about the question, I was like, that's one of the key things that everybody was pointing out, that everybody should feel like they belong in their home, also within their community. And when you have a sense of belonging, you you're tend to stay there longer, you tend to feel safer, you tend to do better. You tend to do better within your home life and your professional life. So when you feel like you belong somewhere, that's, you have a home, that's basically that home feeling. We belong is home in so many words. Well, I would like to add on to it by saying um, I feel like when you have a sense of belonging in your community, um, as far as not just being in your own tiny home by yourself, but the other tiny homes that sit around you, you need to have relationships built with the people that are in your community. And when you have a feel like a sense of belonging, it makes it where you're able to achieve things better because now you feel like you have a support system with you. You're not just homeless and living in a tiny home by yourself because even though you may have a tiny home now, just because you have a home doesn't take you out of the mind state of being homeless because people don't understand it is a psychological thing being homeless. So when you feel like you have a sense of belonging within your community, especially with people who understand what you're going through. They don't have to understand the exact situation, but since they have experienced the same things that you have experienced, you guys can kind of, you know, piggyback off each other and build each other up. It's like a chain that can be broken now because now you all have each other. It's a new family. Yeah, that's a great, great comment. And I think echoes some of the comments that were talked about earlier this morning. Lala, you want to say? Okay, just to piggyback on what Nick said about being homeless, you could be in school, you could have a job, you have two jobs, three, and you still can be homeless. Like, it don't matter what you're going through or what you got right now. You never know what the future holds for you. Um, you know, sometimes we go through things and we try to be positive, and sometimes we're negative, and we try to be so positive at times, and at times we feel inside like, we had that negative attitude, but the negative attitude doesn't want to come out. And I'm one of those people that's very positive, very understandable, but at times you get to the point and you get, even when you're leaving with everybody in one place, it's still we have a lot of problems with everybody else, or either you have a problem with this person or this person, we always have problems. And some people just need to calm down, take it easy, and try to build a relationship instead of making it look like you don't want to be in that place anymore. So Maria says, calm down, all <laughs> you, just calm down. All right, let's move on to the Sorry. next one. 
So this one was an interesting one for us uh, when it came up. Uh, there was a lot of discussion about kind of creating a community, but that it's in a community. And one of the quotes that came up that sort of uh, was very intriguing to us was, uh, others are scared of us, but what about us being scared in the neighborhood? Uh, and so maybe, Nick, you want to start with that one? I was oh, going to start. Sorry. Yes. Um, to kind of bring it back around to the community, we can feel safe within the tiny homes community. But what about the community outside? That's what we got to reach to, too. I heard a lot of people, um, I think it was Alan and the guy from Nashville, they both said that they brought people from the outside into the tiny homes neighborhood. And that, I think that's a better way to feel safer because when you're secluded, I mean, you're literally directly in the middle of a neighborhood that's already established. So a new neighborhood that's coming in, they're like, okay, what's that? They're gonna wonder what that neighborhood is. And with the tiny homes community, you know, it could be private or it can be open, which I feel that the openness is way better because I feel that it's safer. It's less likely to be attacked if it's open, when it's known in the community, people are more drawn to it and they're more liable to help. I stay in TLP for a whole year and a half and people didn't even know that that building was right there and they stayed across the street from it for five years. How? Teen Living Program, TLP. Yes, <laughs> Teen Living Program. So it's like when you have these type of programs or you're literally trying to build a whole nother community within the community, you have to open it up. I feel that it'll work better that way as well, especially if it's a gated community, especially depending on what areas you're, you're in, they're going to come for it. It's just, it's a, it's a logical thing. It's going to happen. So with community, it's like you can establish all the snakeness that you want within that private community, but you have to establish it on the outside as well because you don't want to come to your gate and feel like, oh, I'm not safe unless I'm getting in my house. That's not a good thing. At least when you open up, well, okay, I know this business here, or I know this lady down the street. If you have an open house where people can come in, I was hearing Alan say they have them where you could come visit for three days and you can help, you know, during spring break and summer break. Tiny homes should have things like that because it opens up the community, it brings more people in, the resources are more known, people who need that resource, they are knowledgeable of it now, and they know where to go and they know how to utilize it. So when it comes to community, I feel that it should be private to an extent, but everybody within the outer community should know that that place is there. Piggybacking off of what Casey said, we had spoke uh, somewhat about the earlier plans about putting a community center right in front, and I felt like when we talked about having a community center, we didn't just think as far as what can the community center can do for those who live inside of the complexes. It was also like, well, if we build the community center, that can be the focal point to the community to look in and say, okay, this nice little building is sitting up here. What's this all about? Then when you come in, that's when you open up doors for the people inside the community to learn how to become self-sufficient again because then you're opening things inside of the community center such as a laundry facility or you're opening up things like a bike shop or things like that that where people outside of the community can come in and get services done and it's also like you're teaching the people with inside the community a trade at the same time so therefore i kind of think it's like a yang yang thing you can't it's like it's a circle that goes around. I help you, you help me. You let this community stay here. You come in, we can fix on bikes. You can do laundry, you can come in. I don't know what other things, like a thrift store we talked about. A few, a few different ideas, but a community center is a community center. I'm pretty sure that we have a lab. It's kind of like a work in progress. You gotta figure out what you can do and what you can't do. But at the end of the day, I feel like putting a community center smack dab in front of the tiny homes for the community to come in and that's there where they can actually see what's going on without having to walk through the community and invade some of the homeless people's space. The community center is almost like their welcoming thing where they can feel comfortable what's going on behind them in their community and see what's going on and don't have to be alert so much because homeless people do get a bad rap a lot. They don't think there can be working homeless people or homeless people who are in school or homeless that who have just become homeless because of bad financial circumstances. It's, in my case, my mother had two strokes while I was 15 and I had to work a job while going to school for two years and maintain a 3.0 GPA and take care of my family until I couldn't afford an $800 a month rent no more. 
So that's my situation. People don't think that you're homeless and you've come for great things and you just fell on hard times. They see homeless and they think dirty or why do I want to be bothered or I don't want that in my neighborhood. And I feel like yeah. it's up to us to change the outlook of what homeless is for the community who does not go through it. So what you're saying, Nick, is that you're just really lazy? Is that... <laughs> yeah. Will, did you want to say something? Yeah, to um, go off of what Casey said about the community being open, um, when people don't know about things, they become scared and afraid, and then they become hostile. And that's what, not what we're trying to do. We want to open up the community so people know that it's safe. They can go there, attend all the activities that are there, and to be as a family as one. So. And all, going off of what all three said is like, that's right, because <laughs> if they don't have it open, we're, they're not going to know we're there, or we're not even, they're going to be like outcasts. And we're, we don't want to feel outcasts. We want to feel like we're part of the community and be part of the community, not just outsiders. We're, right. in, we're in the community. That's all I gotta say. Okay, so on that, on that note, uh, let's jump on. Uh, a number of people talked about, when we were working with everybody, the idea of uh, not just sort of relating to the community, but also how does it fit in the world? And there was a lot of environmental discussion and things. I know this is one that, Nick, I think you're interested in. Well, I don't know about how much it would cost. I've tried to do my research, but you just can't get <laughs> the cost of a production this big, and I'm not really good with architecture. I'm leading that You were great with architecture. Yeah. yeah, you guys did all good. <laughs> a few ideas that I thought were a good thing when you're building a tiny home community is ways to keep it energy efficient. I was thinking maybe have panels on top of the house for solar energy. That way you don't have to put so much money into electricity costs or get you a greenhouse, compost. You know, as many different ways you can cut down on the price of running a tiny homes community, so that way, the money that you have left over, you can go build more houses. And I, I just, I think one of the ways that you're thinking about this is kind of not that upfront cost is the big issue, yeah. but the long running cost. Like, how do you how do you be somebody who has been recently homeless in this situation and keep the costs down? So the electricity cost is down. Maybe you can grow your own food. Maybe you can yeah. those kinds of issues. That, that those we, possibilities are, are yeah, very real in this kind of setting. Because we even talked about, I think, growing gardens and maybe putting one next to each tiny home so that way the tiny home owners could have a vegetable garden. So, you know, if you want to go outside and you want to get a fresh tomato or anything, you can go pick that right outside of your garden. Who wants to go to the grocery store and pay for it? You can't really afford things when you're homeless. <laughs> so this is how we thought about things right. because since we have been in that situation before, we can kind of tell you, like, what things we can't really afford, what things we put on the back burner to afford, and what things are a uh, necessity. So I feel like if you look at the long run cost as opposed to how much it costs just to build it now and build it quick, you'll come out with something like, meaningful, yeah, useful. Something, yeah. something more meaningful. In the interest of time, I'm going to jump to the last of these. Yeah. Uh, okay, so the, we mentioned the plus one concept and the idea of choices, and I think this was a kind of came back over and over again in lots of different ways. People had really strong feelings about this. Um, okay. Well, um, about the control versus freedom. Well, every shelter either has a curfew or sub. We are kind of controlled, kind of. But at the same time, we understand, and we understand that they care about us and everything. At the same time, we want to just stay out sometimes and just be free for just one day and not be worrying about coming home at 6, 9 o'clock. You got to be at home at a certain time. <laughs> um, I'm going to go with the, the plus one. I was hearing one of the presenters say earlier, you know, that when people get into a program that they have to get rid of their dogs or their pets and stuff. Not only that, but mothers have to find somewhere to go for their child to go as well. And that's one of the things about programs is that they don't tend to single mothers as they should. 
with the plus one is basically, well, if you have a child, this is your plus one. And that is real hard for mothers to find out here. With, so with the, the plus one implemented in the timely homes, that's what kind of set timely homes apart from other um, programs because it tends to the needs of people who are like blind and they need their dogs or people who just love cats and they want their cats. Like some people don't deal with people really well and they tend to animals better. So sometimes they need their animal in that house and the plus one is that's what that states. Like you're a plus one, this is that. And I'm kind of going to piggyback off Nick as well um, with the community and the positive uh, impact. It's already positively impacting the neighborhood because people are aware of it. The, the competition itself got people aware of what's going on. So it's already positively impacting people. It's impacting people because it has the need, the people who need it involved in the actual program. It's, they're telling us that we have say in what we need. And like Maria was saying, we're kind of controlled with the, the the curfews and the chores, which we know we don't like to do, but <laughs> but in the tiny homes, it gives us that freedom. It's like, okay, we can come home, but we know we have a place to go because if you miss curfew, you don't have a place to go. So there's that, that free freedom there. And with the plus one, you can have company, you know, you can have a friend over there. It's giving the people a lot of freedom and it's positively impacting the community because like with the garden, also Nick was saying, See, liver programs had a garden that taught us how to grow our own food. If we have a garden in the tiny homes community, we can open that up to the outer community and teach them how to grow their own food. Because like Nick was saying, food is high. Not only when you're homeless, but period. Like, it's just in general. So we can teach, we can teach people. Like he said, you could come in the, the resource areas. Like, it's a give and take. It's a give and take. That positive impact we put out, you put out, and you get it back. It's karma. It's, it's basically that. And the and the um, I really love the plus one thing because the mothers with children that is the hardest thing to find for a woman that is homeless in general. That is the top thing. Those are the most people who end up couch surfing because they don't want to be separated from that child. Sometimes they have to, and they was like, okay, well, I'll take a down point. You know, you can go stay with my mom. But what about those people who don't have nobody? They could send their baby to. That's just, that's something that is a need. And it's a good thing that people who need it have an input on it. There, there were a couple of other things that came up. I'm going to briefly mention them and then hand it back. Um, one thing that came up was storage. And I know Lara is somewhere in the audience. Um, somewhere there. So, so this is something that I'm sure she's going to talk about. But one thing that really came up was that, you know, where do you put all your stuff if you have a tiny home? So perhaps the plus one piece is a storage shed. Um, also, you know, when, when you think about the kinds of things people need, all of us need in order for us to be functioning individuals and, you know, be at peace with ourselves, you know, what makes us us? That the tiny homes residents also need to have those pieces that make them them. And Lala, I wonder if you would mind sharing, you had these ideas about sort of an art gallery and you know, how do you sort of bring the artistic sensibility into some of this? Because I know you had a lot of ideas. I don't want to put you on the spot. You can think if you want, but you had a lot of interesting things to say about how that might happen. Basically, um, well, I'm all about like arts, like you know, drama, acting, dancing. And so I was saying like, but you know, I could feel like myself, if I had one of these tiny homes, I would have like a mini dance studio or like a, a big walk-in closet or like a makeup, a big makeup mirror and stuff like that. And like decorate my house like pink and you know, different colors and stuff like that. Yeah, the, the plus one idea has a lot of resonance, right? For some folks, it's, it's like I need a space to have my baby, right? To have a place for the baby and other people, it, like one of the folks who's not here now was talking about was really into fitness and wanted a place to work out. So just oh. having just enough space to be able to do oh. that. And I think Lala's idea of like, you know, look, my thing is I need space for the makeup and to be able to do the thing. Like that's really important. You can't you can't forget those those issues for folks because it's uh, that's about like, you know, who we are. It's the what makes you you. And that's sort of the process here. You want to close it out? Just to close out, I was saying uh, maybe what they were talking about was the customability um, that we added on. 
Yeah, no, go ahead. keep going. Oh, no, I was saying, like, we actually put in our designs to leave open room for people to come in and put their own impact on what they want their tiny home to look like. So if you wanted to customize your house, it would be completely customizable. So that way you feel like it's yours and not just some tiny house that was given to you. Right. Maria? Well, about the plus one, it's very interesting that you have the single moms, and then sometimes you know how parents, sometimes their parents are just a single person. You should also think about not just, just homeless youth along with other homeless people. I, like last time, I'm gonna share something, I don't know why, but it just came up to my mind. Last time I was walking down the blue line going under and this young boy was just sitting there homeless. Another time there was an old man just sitting there being homeless, just begging for money. Yeah. And it's kind of not just us, it's also other people affected by what we're experiencing. And it's very hard to go into it, but yeah. yeah. Will, did you want to say something? Yeah, um, the plus one is there to help you be who you really are inside. Um, that's the big idea overall. For me, that's my books. Like, I need my books. That's who I am. So. Okay, I want to say one last thing. Final words. I, okay. I want to say one last thing, because this stood out to me earlier. The guy who was in Tent City, and he said he stayed in the apartment, the Siski square foot apartment himself, and he heard people say, well, they slept in the tents. They'll be all right. No, they're, no. No, <laughs> okay. It, the fact that he stayed in the apartment himself that amazed me because he actually got the experience of what it's like to live in that place. He chose to do that. And the fact that he was like, no, they're not going to be all right because they sleep in a tent. But everybody thinks that way. They're like, oh, you don't slept on the ground before. You'll be small. You'll be all right in a tiny box. But no, I wouldn't be comfortable in a tiny box because I wasn't sleep comfortable sleeping on the ground. Like, I want a space where I can stretch out and move around. Like, and that's why I, I was really happy at the fact that that's what brought him into the tiny homes project that's something that if people experience that i don't think they would say people would be okay sleeping on the floor i just don't think that would be possible one last word i agree with you uh, with what you just said oh uh, because you're living there's some people that are living they're comfortable like that but some people are not like that and i think they should be the same living spaces as they have they shouldn't be different they should be the same because we all are experiencing homelessness it's not it's not very good, it's just, okay, that's all I gotta say. I, I think that really was a good last word, and I'm sure you're not surprised that our, that from the heart of all of this came some really, really great designs. Territoryap.org, we have all the designs posted. Please come and take a look at it, and please do continue to talk to our young people. But then Mike has one more thing to tell you. Territory, Territory AP, it, uh, we started in Albany Park, so uh, Territory AP. Um, and then uh, the last thing, one of the things that uh, Territory always does uh, whenever we have an opportunity is we like to make it as interactive as possible. Uh, it's a little bit awkward in a situation like this to do that, so what we've done is we actually have written uh, four questions out uh, and they're on cards. We're gonna hand out the cards and put them onto the tables. Uh, and then you can write out one or all four or whatever. And we have our little installation in the back, the little tiny home, tiny home uh, in the back. And you just, once you've written it out, you can just go put it on. And then at the end of uh, tomorrow, you can swing by, check it out, see what everybody else said. It's all anonymous. It's all just to kind of see what you think. Uh, the questions are, uh, uh, would you support uh, zoning for a backyard tiny home? And then kind of related to that, what about at your house? Like, do you think that's a good idea, that people should be able to put tiny homes in their, in their backyards? Uh, next question is, how would you feel about the balance of freedom and security, which came up over and over and over again in our discussions? Uh, should there be a front desk uh, with a security person and a check-in? Uh, should there be no front desk, but there's a property manager? Is it just that the site is well sited and fenced and, and clear? Or is there no fence and it's just part of the community, right? Or is it something else? Uh, and then uh, how would you react uh, if this community of formerly homeless youth, such as our panel, uh, was moved onto your block? Like not some other block, but your block. 
Um, and I know from my own thinking about this, I know my neighbors would just have a fit. Uh, I would love it because I think it would be really interesting conversation, but it would be a big deal in my neighborhood, and it's really interesting to sort of make it sort of your own. And then lastly, sort of why tiny homes? So we'll, uh, we'll spread those out. You can answer them anytime uh, over the afternoon or tomorrow morning, and then just take it back and put it up in the thing. On that note, I'd like to say a great big thank you to our panelists. <laughs>